Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jérôme Pirlo, and I'm in charge of the uh, Procurement for Accelerator and Technology uh, within the Procurement Group at CERN. And it is my pleasure uh, to be here today and to present the uh, Procurement Rules at CERN, as well as the many business opportunities CERN offers. This presentation is divided into four sections. A brief introduction about CERN. I'll talk about the legal framework, the budget, what we buy. Then I will talk about the procurement service, our principles, our procedures to obtain offers. Then I will take you to our procurement website where you can have uh, all the information such as the forthcoming <laughs> invitation to tenders. And then finally, I will try to convince you to come and work with CERN. So um, CERN is an uh, intergovern intergovernmental organization established in 1953, founded in 1954, and it is governed by public international law. CERN is therefore entitled to establish its own internal rules necessary for its proper functioning, such as the rules under which CERN purchases supplies and services. Um, in 1954, CERN had 12 member states. Today, we are 23 member states, two associate member states uh, in the stage of pre-membership, and five associate member states. There are uh, 2,500 staff members, around 2,000 contractors employees, and more than 13,000 scientists. The in important information of this slide is uh, the annual budget of CERN. 1.2 billion Swiss francs. Uh, where the budget comes from? It comes from the contribution of all the member states and the associate member state. As you can see, Germany is our main contributor with a contribution of 236 million Swiss francs per annum. And you can see India here with a contribution to close to 14 million per annum. This represents a percentage contribution to the CERN budget of 1.18%. As you can see, India is by far the most important contributor amongst all the um, associate member states. In the rest of this presentation, I will only use the term member states, but this will include associate member states as well, since from the procurement perspective, the only difference between the member states and the associate member state resides in the fact that the associate member state cannot exceed their industrial return coefficient. But I will come later uh, in this presentation uh, to that. So what we buy at CERN? We buy recurrent supplies and services necessary for uh, running the organization on a daily basis. And we also buy all the accelerator technologies necessary for uh, the consolidation programs and the uh, new developments. For example, civil engineering, we are buying a lot of uh, construction projects, turnkey projects, renovation of buildings, we are buying uh, lots of mechanical structure to be installed in the accelerator, we are buying um, road works when we are expanding our uh, road network, we are buying a lot of excavation and uh, earthworks when we are uh, digging for new experiments. We also buy a lot of cooling and ventilation system and equipments because when we are creating a new building or we are upgrading the accelerator, we have to install, install new power cooling. In terms of electrical engineering, uh, CERN has the most important private network in Europe. Uh, with an installed power of 200 MVA, we have more than 500 transformer, 1,000 high voltage cubicle, 2,000 switchboard, 45,000 circuit breaker, so we have an important need in buying equipments like transformer, cable, cable trays, UPS system, batteries, everything that basically is needed to run a private electrical network. And of course, we uh, place contract for the installation of and the maintenance of the, uh, of the network. In terms of information and technology, this is, for example, um, a picture representing one of our data centers. So as you can imagine, we have an important uh, demand for routers, server, mainframes, switch, network equipment, and of course software, personal computers, and laptop. We also buy a lot of mechanical engineering, uh, machining, fine blanking, stamping, uh, 
sheet metal works, we buy raw material finished, semi-finished, and also a lot of off-site engineering such as uh, finite element modelization, uh, measurement, testing, and so on. We buy a lot of electronics and radio frequency for the experiment, uh, low voltage, high voltage, power supply, PCBs, assemble boards, active and passive components, amplifiers. Uh, but we also buy cryogenic equipment, vacuum vessels, vacuum pumps, optic, photonics, uh, baryon chambers, particle detectors, uh, transport and handling equipment, basically everything from the highest technological equipment down to the office supply, furniture, papers, toilet papers, printers, everything that is needed to run the organization. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the uh, procurement expenditure. This is the expenditure over the year 2000 to 2018. The yellow curves represent the expenditure corresponding to the service contract, and the gray line here corresponds the expenditure, well, gray or brown, I don't know, corresponds to the expenditure for the supply contract. This dark blue line here corresponds to the expenditure made on non cern budget. For instance, ex uh, um, experience can ask us to procure some equipment or services, and then this is not paid by CERN. This is paid by what we call a team budget. So, um, but we take care of this. And as you may have all have guessed, this blue line here on top is the sum of the three lines and represent our expenditure. As you can see here, we have an important peak uh, between 2003 and 2007. This corresponds to the construction of the LHC. We have another slight peak here, which corresponds to what we call the long shutdown. It's a period during which the accelerators are switched off and uh, our uh, technical colleagues from the engineering departments and the beam departments are intervening in the machine to perform consolidation and uh, renovation activities. There is another slight peak here which corresponds to LS2, the long shutdown number two. And this very last peak here corresponds to the procurement of all the equipment ne needed for um, the high luminosity project. Uh, this is the project mentioned by our Director General, which uh, is increasing the, uh, the power of uh, the LHC. The very important message in this uh, slide is the fact that the long-term average value of the expenditure is approximately 500 million Swiss francs per annum. This is it for the introduction. I will now uh, talk about the uh, procurement group. The mission of the procurement group is to procure supply and services for CERN, meeting all requirements at the lowest overall possible cost, and while uh, achieving a balanced industrial return for all the member states and respecting the procurement rules. So there are six principles governing um, the procurement rules. The first principle is uh, transparency, uh, transparency and impartiality. So CERN purchase supply and services and award contract in compliance with the principle of full transparency and impartiality. That means that any time after a contract is placed, bidders that have uh, submitted an offer can contact the procurement officer in charge of the invitation to tender and ask him information about their bid. Where is the, well, how, how is the bid ranked? Is it second, third? What is the price difference between their bid and the winning bid, what is the strong point of their bid, what is the, 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 the weak point of the bid. And the procurement officer will be very happy to provide this kind of information to the company because it is also in our interest that the company understands where and how they can improve their bid for the next time. The second principle is limited tendering. CERN being funded by um, money coming from the member states it is normal that uh, the tendering are limited to the firm established in the member states. The third principle is objectivity and fair competition. So uh, certain invitation to tender documents are drafted in an objective way, so has to ensure fair competition between all the bidders. To that end, we have even uh, created a specification committee, and one of the role of the specification committee is to go in detail through all the documents and make sure that the content will not give an advantage to one of the company 
uh, over the other builders. Uh, the fourth principle is selective tendering procedures. At CERN, the tendering does not take the form of an open invitation to tender. You have to be invited and then selected to be able to receive the technical documents, the commercial documents, and even to upload your bid in our um, IT system. If you are not invited, your bid will not be taken into consideration, even if you send it uh, via email. The fifth principle is confidentiality. The opening of the bid, the uh, negotiation, clarification, evaluation, and the preparation of the contracts is strictly confidential. That means that during that phase, we do not communicate with the bidder. We will not provide any kind of information. And finally, the last principle is adjudication basis. For supply contracts, the adjudication basis is always the lowest compliant bidder. For service contract, the adjudication basis is always the best value for money, which means the most economically advantageous bid. Uh, when I say that for supply contract, it is always the lowest compliant bidder, actually, this is not correct. In some rare cases, uh, we have to seek for prior um, authorization by our finance committee, but we can award contract on the best value for money. But this is really rare. So what we buy at CERN? Um, we buy two types of products, off-the-shelf or non-standard, but which can be produced with existing manufacturing techniques and technologies. And in that case, CERN will uh, write and dispatch what we call a functional specification. That means that we will, um, uh, in the technical specification, we will impose the parameters and characteristics of the product, and the entire freedom uh, will be left uh, to the bidder to define the technical solution, of course, provided that we respect the technical specification in all points. For non-standard products, where the industry has neither the know-how nor the immediate interest in developing it for its existing market, CERN will write what, what is known as a build-to-print specification. So that means that in the technical specification, we will detail all the various steps uh, of the manufacturing process. We will provide the bidders with the list of parts, components, raw materials, and the bidders will only have to put the activity related to the manufacturing and the procurement of the parts, components, and raw material. In any case, the products will be installed in the accelerator. So this, those products are really, really important for CERN. So we will either ask for prototypes or pre-series before authorizing the series production. In some case, for very complex requirements, we will ask prototypes, then pre-series, then we will qualify the pre-series, and then we will authorize the um, series production. This is the... Uh, this chart represents the procurement procedure, so basically how do we obtain offers. It's quite simple, as you can see. There are three types of inquiries at CERN. The inquiry... Uh, The uh, inquiry is below 10,000 Swiss francs, the inquiry is between 10 and 200,000 Swiss francs, and the inquiry is above 200,000 Swiss francs. So um, the inquiries below 10,000 Swiss francs are quite easy to manage at CERN because it is the responsibility of the uh, technical officer to manage the price inquiry. Uh, he will create his own technical specification he has to request a minimum of three bids, and then he will place the purchase order to the lowest compliant bidder. The procurement service responsibility will be limited to the verification of the purchase order. So the procurement officer in charge will check the technical specification, make sure that uh, the, the quotation received are based on the same technical specification, and that the purchase order is placed with the lowest compliant bidder. If the technical officer doesn't feel comfortable with the idea of managing himself the price inquiry, he can always uh, ask for our support and then we will manage it. For inquiries uh, between 10,000 Swiss francs and 200,000 Swiss francs, the whole process will be managed by the procurement service. The uh, technical officer will uh, write the technical specification, the procurement officer will uh, write the tender form and the, uh, all the commercial documents, and the uh, documents will be sent to uh, the list of firm. Uh, 
the submission deadline is four weeks, and uh, we have to uh, request a minimum of three bids. The purchase order will be placed to the lowest compliant bidder. For every price inquiries with a minimum estimated value of 50,000 Swiss francs, we will send for information the documents to the ILO. ILO stands for Industrial Liaison Officer. I will uh, come to the role uh, in detail of the ILO later in, the, in this presentation. Now for inquiries above 200 Swiss francs, this is a bit more complex and it's a longer procedure. Uh, inquiries above 200 Swiss francs are called invitation to tender. So everything starts internally but by a document called a departmental request. It's an IT form that is signed and approved by all the stakeholders at CERN and the budget orders. And when this uh, departmental request is approved, it is when the procurement service learns of the new requirement. So based on the uh, nature of the uh, departmental request, we will appoint a procurement officer. The procurement officer will sit with a technical officer and all the, 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 the stakeholders of the project and we will define the, the, tech, the, um, the procurement strategy. That means that, for example, we will uh, decide whether or not we uh, authorize group of firm or if it has to be single firm only, do we authorize subcontracting or not, uh, if we authorize subcontracting is it limited to uh, uh, specific activities or is it open to all the activities. Um, which uh, production method will we choose? Is it uh, machining? Is it uh, EDM? Is it blanking? Is it stamping? Uh, do we want to split the contract in two contractors, three contractors? Uh, is there any uh, IP involved or not? If yes, are we uh, ready to give away the IP or do we want to protect it? And things like do we want to supply the, the bidder, the contractor with the raw material or do we want him to include the raw material in his bid. All those kind of details will be discussed during the uh, startup meeting. As soon as the startup meeting is over, the procurement officer will publish in our shopping list the uh, new invitation to tender. So this will be public to everybody, to all the companies that uh, come and visit our website. Then there are three uh, main phases in our invitation to tender. The first phase is the market survey. The objective of the market survey is to contact the firms and select them. The second phase is the invitation to tender. It's the um, preparation of the specification to tender and the dispatch of the specification to tender. And the third phase is the adjudication process. So for the first phase, for the market survey, um, we will, the procurement service and the technical officer will prepare two documents, a brief technical description and a qualification questionnaire. The documents will be sent to the list of firm and the firm will have four weeks to send back their qualification questionnaire to CERN. The important information here is that the initial list of firm is created by CERN based on our supplier database. That means that if you are not registered in our supplier database, we do not know about you. So there are very little chance that you will be contacted. The only possibilities are either the ILO knows about your firm and will contact me and ask me to add the uh, firm in the original list, or that you went on our website and you declare your interest and then in that case we will contact you. Otherwise, except for that, we don't know your company. At the end of the four weeks, procurement service and technical department will sit together and will analyze all the reply to the market survey. Based on the reply, we will uh, reject companies or we will qualify them. So the outcome of the market survey is a list of qualified company to uh, which we will send the invitation to tender. The company that uh, will not have been qualified, will receive an email briefly detailing why they were not qualified, if it's a problem of uh, annual turnover too low or lack of reference or uh, lack of manpower or this kind of, of elements. Then we will start the second phase. The second phase is the invitation to tender properly. So the technical officer will uh, write the technical specification and all the technical annex. 
and the procurement officer will prepare commercial documents and what is very important, the tender form. This will allow the bidders to uh, submit their price. The whole set of documents will be sent to the specification committee I mentioned before. Again, the role of the specification committee is to go through all the documents and make sure that uh, we do not give an advantage to one bidder over the other. When we receive the clearance from um, the specification committee, we will dispatch all the documents to the selected companies. As a standard, the submission deadline is four weeks, but we sometimes extend it to five or six weeks when, it's very, when, when the requirement is really intricate. Um, if the requirement is very complex, we even organized at CERN what we call a bidder's conference, and all the bidders are uh, coming to CERN. We go through all the documents, we spend one day together, we go through uh, the technical specification, the tender form, and we even take them on the premises so that they can take the, the full measure of the environment. Uh, the first three weeks following the dispatch of the invitation to tender document is called the clarification process. During the first three weeks, the bidders can ask any question to the procurement officer. The procurement officer will neutralize the question in order uh, to make sure that the company asking the question cannot be identified uh, by, uh, by the other bidders. This is to guarantee fair competition. And then we will provide all the bidders with the same answer. The idea is that all the bidders should have the same level of information. And then after the submission deadline, all the bids should be uploaded in our uh, IT system. Then we will start the third phase, which is the opening and evaluation of the bid. So the technical officer, commercial officer, uh, will go through the, the tender form, will see if all the requested documents have been submitted. We will recalculate all the unit price to make sure that there are no mistakes in it. And then we will see if we can apply the alignment rule. What is the alignment rule? The alignment rule is an internal rule uh, dedicated to improve the industrial balance return between the member states. Um, the, uh, the, rules, the alignment rule says that under certain conditions, a bidder offering goods originating in a poorly balanced member states is offered to uh, align its price to that of the lowest compliant bidder and thereby be awarded the contract. So by stating this rule, I'm introducing two concepts. The first one is the poorly balanced member state, and the second one is the country of origin. The country of origin for service contract is the country in which the uh, firm is established. For supply contracts, the country of origin is the country in which the good has been manufactured or where the last major transformation will take place. If at least 60% of the bid originates in poorly balanced member states, then the entire bid is considered as poorly balanced. And now the status of poorly balanced member states. So CERN uh, classify its member states into three categories. The first one is well-balanced member states, the second one is poorly balanced member states, and then the very poorly balanced member states. And to perform this classification, we have to have a look at what we call the industrial return coefficient. The industrial return coefficient is the ratio between a member state's percentage share of the value of the supply contract and that member state's percentage contribution to the CERN budget over the same period. So if the industrial return coefficient is equal or higher than one, then the country is considered as well balanced. And in short, that means that we, do not we will not make extra effort to award contract to that country, is already received, to that member state, he's already receiving a lot. For poorly balanced member states and very poorly balanced member states, this is where we try to uh, help and uh, apply the alignment rule. So poorly balanced member states are comprised between 0, 03 and 0, 01, and very poorly are uh, below 0, 03. So again, the, al the alignment rule says that under certain conditions, um, a bidder offering goods originating in a poorly balanced member states is allowed to align its price to the lowest compliant bidder and thereby be awarded the contract. The conditions being the first one, it has to be a supply contract. We do not apply the alignment rule for service contract. And then the supply contract has to be awarded on lowest compliant basis. The second condition is that the amount of the contract should exceed 100,000 Swiss francs. 
And the third condition is that the price difference between the first bidder and the second bidder shall not exceed 20%. So for example, at the opening of a bid, if we have a bid from a company A for an amount of 1 million Swiss francs and the product originates from France, France being well balanced, and a company B offering goods originating from India for a value of 1.1 million, India being poorly balanced, we will contact the company B and propose them to align their price to the 1 million. If they are willing to do so, then they will be awarded the contract. And we will contact the company A and we will explain them then, because of the alignment rule, they have been ranked number two. So we are really transparent about that. Um, so this is for information, the classification for uh, this year. Uh, the, the year is between the 1st March 2019 until uh, end of February 2020. Um, it is based on the mean value of the industrial return coefficient over the four previous calendar year. And uh, as you can see, India today is considered as very poorly balanced member states. And this is wha why we are here for, because we would like to see this change. This varies from year to year, yes. And, uh, and every year, Every year when we uh, update the list, you can see member states jumping from one column to the other in both directions. As you can see, uh, India joined CERN uh, in 2017. The return coefficient was not really good. This is normal, it's the first year. It even went down in 2018. Then the ILO was appointed and we uh, saw directly a change and it's now going up. It is still low, 0 0.2, it's, it's really low, especially considering the technical capabilities of a country like, like India. But we are, convenient, uh, we are convinced that uh, we will uh, manage to improve this. Sorry? I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that after. Uh, this is for information, a couple of Indian suppliers uh, for 2019. Not all of them are here, but uh, the most recent ones, Can Corner, um, did some uh, numerization of negatives from CERN. Uh, Department of Atomic Energy did some uh, material verification. Uh, we worked a lot with Tubex. Micropack provided some PCB to CERN, and we have seen that they were upstairs. And uh, OM tubes in, uh, in Mumbai also provided CMS tube uh, to CERN. Uh, it's, uh, but this is just uh, an extraction. And I. Uh, added this picture in this presentation because this is the very last supply that we received from India. It's a prototype for a project that is about to be launched at CERN. This product um, has been manufactured by a company called Deccan Engineering Works in Nashik. And uh, there were the tolerances, surface tolerances were quite uh, difficult and the product has been ranked by uh, high quality by the engineer in charge of the project. So that means that we are full confident that we can have good products from, from India and they even supply ahead of the, of the plan. So now I'm going to talk about the procurement website. Uh, it's very simple to access our procurement website. In the browser, if you type www.cern.ch, you will uh, reach our public web page. At the very bottom of the public web page, you have a link, you cannot miss it, it's named doing business with CERN. If you click on that link, you will access to the procurement web page. And from that page, you can find all the information that have been given to you in this presentation, the procedures, the template, the documents, the contacts, you can find everything from here. Uh, for example, doing business with CERN and key reference document, you have access to the procedures and the general conditions for tendering. Here you have access to the business opportunities, this is the, the link to register in our database. And this is uh, all the contacts at CERN. You can find the contacts of the ILO. You can find the contacts of all the procurement officers. And you can also find the contact of all the technical person in charge of the equipment at CERN. So for example, if you have a question about switchboard or transformer, you click on that link, you go to switchboard transformer, and you will have the contact details of the person in charge. Those persons are well aware that their name is listed there and they know that they are requesting information and they are happy to, to answer. 
So for example, if you uh, select this uh, link, business opportunities at CERN, then you will have access to our shopping list. Our shopping list um, is updated on a daily basis and you can find all the invitation to tender ongoing at CERN. So uh, the first information that you have is the publication date, which corresponds to the uh, date of the startup meeting. Then you have the type of contract, if it's a supply contract or a service contract. Then you have the unique reference number. This reference number will follow the uh, invitation to tender during the whole process. And this is the first question that the procurement officer will ask when you will uh, contact him, what is the reference of the IT? We are managing a lot, a lot of invitation to tender, so that's the only way we, um, that's the only reference we use. Then we uh, have here the activity code. The activity code is very important. When you will register in our database, you will be proposed a list of activity codes and you will have to select in that list the code corresponding to the core activity of your company. This is the only way that we can match the invitation to tender and the supplier that are in our database. So it is very important to make this uh, selection properly. Then you will have a brief description of uh, what we need. You can extend it, read much more, and have access to uh, some technical documents like drawings if, if you want to have uh, f further information. You have the cost range. We even tell you uh, our own estimation of the contract, if it's going to be below 750,000, if it's going to be below 5 million, above 10 million, or above 50 million. But this is just for information. Huh? You make your own quotation and uh, you don't rely too much on this. Then you have the scheduled date for the market survey and the scheduled date for the invitation to tender. And you have all the contact details of either the procurement officer or the technical officer. If we uh, make this contact available, it's for a very simple reason. We encourage you to contact those person if you have any question concerning the market survey or the invitation to tender. This is our job to reply to you and to provide you uh, with some answers. Um, so, uh, if you click on that link here, you will um, access our uh, supplier database registration. Either you are either registered in our database and then you can uh, modify your contact and all the details here by logging in. If it's the first time, you click on that icon here, register. And then it just takes 10 minutes. You have four windows to fill in. First one is you declare your uh, firm, if it's a single firm or a combination of firm, the name of the company, the VAT number. Then you will have to add your address and contact person. Every time we ask for a technical contact and a commercial contact, please remember to modify the contact if there are some uh, changes in your company. Then you will have access to the list of procurement code I was just talking about. It is very important to select the right um, procurement code and uh, see we will even ask your bank details even, even without doing <laughs> business with us. It is very important that you register in our database. It's the only way to be visible for further opportunities. Uh, yesterday we had a lot of uh, very positive meeting with uh, Mr. Sarkar and the various companies that we met and we really realized that there is a misunderstanding it is not because you exchange with CERN and you receive emails from CERN that you are registered. This registration must be made by the company. We do not register the company uh, simply because we don't have all your details, the VAT and bank details. So it is mandatory that the company register in our database. If you uh, have any problems registering, you can uh, send an email to supplier DB support and uh, a person will call you back and will help you uh, completing the form online. And then from uh, the procurement webpage, if you click here on contact, you will have access, as I said, to all the technical uh, person in charge of the equipment. You will have access to all the procurement officer and you will also have access to your ILO. ILO stands for Industrial Liaison Officer. The ILO is appointed by the member states and the role of the ILO is to facilitate the communication between CERN and the suppliers. The ILO are also available to support the companies in their uh, local area and 
uh, explain them how to do business with CERN, maybe how to uh, uh, complete a qualification criteria and things like that. So this position is fulfilled by Mr. Sarkar, who is present with us today. And I take this opportunity to thank him for the excellent uh, support he's providing CERN and the good relation uh, we have with him on a daily basis. And uh, my advice is make yourself known to the ILO. He has an overview of all the invitation to tender and the price inquiry issued by CERN. So he's the very first person who can call CERN and say, hey, Jerome, could you, by the way, add this company in this for this IT? Or could you please contact that company? Could you please go and visit that company? And we are very happy to do so. So Mr. Scar Mr. Sarkar is the very important person to know. And um, I would like to uh, share with you a couple of useful information about successful bidder and contractors. They are all registered in our database, all of them. All of them have made an offer. They are often small or medium sized. There is this uh, misbelief that to work for CERN you have to be a big, huge company, 10,000 person. This is completely wrong. We are working with small company, three person. We are working with medium sized company, 200 person. And we are always happy whatever the size is. What is important is that the company is flexible and ensure full understanding of the technical specification. Do not forget to include in your prices the price for the documentation and for the test. This is an accelerator. Every equipment that will go in the accelerator has to come with documents, drawings, calculation notes, testing. But do not exceed the technical specification. If you exceed the technical specification by uh, willing to show certain how well you can do, the price will be high. And as I mentioned several times in this presentation, for supply contract, the adjudication basis is the lowest compliant. So be careful not to exceed uh, the technical specification. And then finally, make your best offer directly because during the opening phase of the invitation to tender, uh, we will uh, go for uh, the first company. If it's compliant, we do not give the opportunity of the second one to review its price. We just check if we can align, uh, we can apply the alignment rules. If we cannot, the contract will go to the uh, lowest bidder. So make your best offer directly. And then to conclude this presentation, I would like to say a few words about uh, the impact of doing business with CERN. Many consultants and universities have uh, conducted research uh, about that, and I will share with you the most recent studies and the most compelling one. Uh, the first is a study conducted by Castelnovo in 2018, and they were interested to understand the economic impact of CERN procurement on, on suppliers' performance. And the outcome is that um, certain suppliers are investing more in uh, research and development and are feeling more patents. They have a higher productivity, revenue, and profitability. The uh, second example is a social cost benefit analysis uh, conducted by the University of Milan in Italy. And the conclusion was that each Swiss francs invested in the high luminosity project pays back approximately 1.8 uh, Swiss francs on social benefits, including scientific, economic, and cultural values. And then finally, the last one is a supplier survey that has been conducted in 2017 with close to 700 uh, suppliers in 33 countries. And the result is that 18% of the firms opened new markets, 42% of the firms have developed new products, 48 have improved their products and their services. 55% have improved their technological learning. 62% have uh, used CERN as a marketing reference. But all of them have derived a great value from working with CERN. So why not you? Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question. So any questions? Any questions?
questions? Uh, any certifications or any compliance related uh, uh, specification that CERN has for uh, procurement you in general? Uh, like for ISO certification or uh, yeah, UL or EU certification? It, it, it really depends on the requirement. Uh, we sometimes make reference to certifications, sometimes not. It really depends on the kind of uh, the type of requirements. It's on a case by case basis. Do you need any uh, documents for registration, documentary evidences? S sorry? Uh, is there any mandatory document references for registration? Yes, uh, during the qualification uh, period, we ask, for example, of similar supply or ex previous experience you might have. We don't want to be like a guinea pig. We don't want you to try your new product at CERN. So we will ask you, have you over the last three years supplied the similar type? Of it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but something similar. We have recently... Um, an invitation to tender for metallic bellows and then we have um, contacted this company in India and we asked them to provide example of or reference of uh, similar supplies which they did so we qualified the company. So any structured uh, capability assessment done regularly on a company? Yeah, we during the market survey we pay visit to companies. If we don't know them or if we want to further understand their capabilities then we will contact the ILO and see if he can organize a visit of the company and we are happy to. It's even interesting for us. Sometimes visiting companies, you realize that they can do much more than what we thought and, uh, and it's also a way for us to be uh, in line with the uh, manufacturing process in, in various companies. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? So thank you for the presentation. That was uh, very useful. Um, I wanted to understand, so you talked about two kinds of, uh, one is services and the other is maybe products uh, as two kinds of con uh, uh, contracts that you may place. Um, where would you place uh, items which are related to software? And software also comes in different kinds. Some things which are for just running uh, standard things and some which is maybe high end for actually looking at the data that comes out. So are all of these also handled in similar commercial terms? Yes, uh, for us softwares are considered a supply because the development is not made on certain site. That's basically the difference. So service contract is when the person are on site. For example, installation of uh, uh, electrical maintenance of the lighting. There is a dedicated team on site. We do not do this. We give this to a company, and this is a service contract. When you develop a software based on our technical specification, you do this in your premises. Though this is this is a supply contract. And for software, we sometimes do pro, uh, proof of concept. And, and so all, all kinds of softwares uh, are openly um, advertised in, in, in the method that you described? Yes, it is. And if you want, we can discuss after the presentation and I can put you in contact with the uh, a person at CERN in charge of the, of the software. You can also find them on uh, who to contact at CERN software licenses and uh, you can find their, their contact details. Uh, yeah. Just uh, if we want to know what is the payment terms, do you give advance along with order or against the supply, how much against like that? Just if any advance, do you have to give bank guarantee for that? Just what is the standard terms? So, sorry, could you repeat the question? There is a resonance here. I, 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 I did not hear the question, sorry. I think it's because the other Yeah, uh, what he's asking is, there, is there any provision for any advance uh, with bank guarantee? Um, so normally we ask for a bank guarantee if we pay in advance. If a company have a liquidity problem or needs to buy a lot of raw material and needs maybe 500,000 Swiss francs or euros to uh, procure the raw materials, we are happy to make a down payment provided that the company will uh, give to certain a bank guarantee. We also have alternative ways of, um, of solving this kind of problem. If you don't have a ranking BB+, we can also uh, provide you with raw materials or 
pay something to the company and ask for a certificate of property and uh, ideally we, we like, like bank guarantees if you want to go down payments but we if you are in a situation where it's a difficult position then we can find an alternative uh, solution thank you Particular field, uh, material is not available in the Indian market. Uh, can you suggest uh, the uh, alternate material? Equivalent. Can you repeat? I can only hear it. What he's saying that suppose you are uh, giving specification for European norms, EN, suppose let us take SS304L, you are specifying uh, European code for that. Now, suppose in Indian market, ASTM material is available, whether it is acceptable. Normally, yes. When we can, we accept both of them. We, um, we will probably write that we want EN or this one or equivalent. Uh, I think for the bellow, we accepted the, uh, the other norms. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I just had a small question on recurring projects. Uh, do you prefer to give the same company uh, a recurring project or do you give an open tender? It's open tender. It's, uh, we have to uh, encourage fair competition, so we cannot use the fact that that company has already done uh, that kind of uh, product to uh, give them the new contract. Normally, if a company has already produced, they know how to fine tune their price and uh, they have an advantage. But Sometimes it's the opposite that happens. The company have one contract and the second one and they believe they are the only one and they tend to increase their price. And then for the third contract, they lose the, the contract. So uh, be right. careful about that. Thank you. Anyway. Whether uh, products are required to be CE marked? Yep. Or it depends? Yep. Okay. It, it, it's, I would say it's, it's mandatory CE marks it. Yeah. Thanks for the elaboration. Uh, my question is about software development. Sometimes you may not know the specification um, that the system uh, you know, has to adhere to. So you need to discover the specification requirements and system specs and so on. So how does CERN uh, you know, uh, function or the procurement in that case? In that Thank case, we will, we will do the uh, best value for money specification. So we will... Uh, tell the concept and then we will find a way to rank the company based on their technical solutions and all the options that they provide. This is the very specific case in which we go to the finance committee and we ask the authorization to place the contract on a best value for money basis. And one more question, like uh, you mentioned about uh, two ways of uh, tendering, like a do and IT. Yep. Uh, like both the do and IT are mentioned in your open website or how is it? No, the, the only the invitation to tender the IT above 200,000 Swiss francs are on our website. Uh, the one below 200,000 Swiss francs are sent for information to the ILO. But uh, the other possibility that you have is that you send the presentation of uh, your company to the procurement officer and to the um, technical person in charge of the equipment, for example, and that we know about you, we will call you back, ask for further question, and then we can include in the initial list when we have something corresponding to your activity. And also like uh, registering online will help us to get the, uh, the inquiry for that uh, do also? Sorry, say that again? Uh, the pre-registration will also help uh, for getting yes. the do inquiries also? Yes, it will help, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in case of uh, services which are to be done by companies off-site, does CERN have a provision where it will be other, uh, either will it be uh, supplies or services? Because, say, for example, quality inspections of part has, parts have to be done prior to it coming to CERN. Is there any provision for suppliers to take that up? Um, could, you, could you repeat, please? Uh, so, uh, basically, in case there are services which have to be done off-site, say a supplier is supplying something to CERN and they have to be inspected and then CERN will take it ahead. Uh, say uh, you're doing a quality inspection of a part. Is there a provision where CERN uh, allows for that to be done, where a third they engage a third-party inspection to we, be done? We, we, we can do... Uh, okay. I, I thought you were asking if 
in that case it's a service or supply contract. Uh, it, it, first of all, it's a supply contract because the service is considered as a supply and uh, it, it really depends on the case. Sometimes when it's very specific, uh, we will uh, launch another IT or price inquiry for the verification, and, but we will indicate this in the technical specification. We will let you know if either you are responsible for that or if a third party will perform the verification. Uh, maybe last one or two questions, Max. Uh, you explained about the alignment rules, but uh, in some of the European countries, there is a provision that uh, first preference for awarding a contract is to be local uh, industry. Are you exempted from that? No, 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 no. We really apply the alignment rules based on our um, principles. So, as I said, France is well balanced, or let's take Italy is well balanced, and then we have India, Israel, poorly balanced. You are second within that range of 20%, you will get the contract if you are willing to align your price. We don't all, yeah, this is something I forgot to mention, but all our um, adjudication on the lowest compliant basis are adjudicated on FCA prices. That means that we do not take into consideration the transport cost. So little deviation from procurement, uh, making the making India initiatives of India, how you will be able to encourage us? You mean increase the return of India? In, in India. Both in, in yeah, but this is why we are here for. We would like to really interest the companies. We would like the companies to register. Yes, yes, we, we, we have manufacturing and some activities are already there. Uh, I think uh, we should close this session now. And uh, as a, uh, it's my privilege uh, to uh, say thank you to Jerome for this excellent presentation and uh, answering a lot of questions from the audience. And I also thank uh, the industry participants and the general audience who have participated today. And uh, I would like to present Jerome with a token of appreciation, one momento. Okay, I'll hand over the mic to Arun Sivastav, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for being present uh, in such large number. Uh, all our industry departments are requested. Uh, rather, this was just, uh, what do you call it in Hindi? Jhalak tiye. So I would like all of you to get in touch with uh, the other projects. You might be working with one particular project. Uh, but with the uh, people from the other project to know what you can do for them as well. The idea is to build up the capacity, okay, the Indian industrial capacity so that you can get as many contracts as possible and uh, sharpen your own skills which could be, because all industrial, uh, international project has one very important thing is you tend to do the job uh, meeting the specifications of that particular country where you are doing it. Working with an Indian standard is very good, or rather that's the one which is required for the Indian uh, um, or company or industry or science uh, project, whatever is coming up in India. But if you are participating outside, let's say you're participating in CERN, FAIR, or ITER, the country in which they are located, you have to meet the specification and standards of that particular thing. This is more challenging. And if you are able to build up the skills for that, then I don't think uh, there is any issue. You, we can all uh, be, you know, uh, all, all the companies could become 
uh, international participants individually or as a consortium. So that's my request that uh, during this period, you, some of you might have exchange cards, better get in touch with all project directors. My all project directors who are sitting over here are, uh, rather they are uh, very open to meeting you and to understand your uh, capabilities. Okay, thanks and all the best. With that, uh, I'll hand over the mic to Mangesh, and he will take over for the CERN week. Uh, thank you, Suman. Let us continue the charm of today's special day during this uh, Vigyan Samagam, which happens to be during the CERN week. And uh, to continue, we have a couple of uh, talks, popular talks, uh, which are complementary to each other. Our first one is on the science aspect of it, and the second one is of the excellent technical contribution that India has made to CERN. So to begin the first talk, uh, I invite Professor uh, James Libby of IIT Madras to come to the dais. So while he's uh, uh, loading his presentation, it's my privilege and honor to introduce uh, the speaker to you. Uh, Professor Libby completed his uh, PhD from University of Oxford, and his research interests are in experimental uh, particle physics. He is right now uh, with the Department of Physics in IIT Madras. Thank you. Can I request the young minds who are sitting in the back to please come forward? my son. Um, <laughs> so, let me try again. Yeah, that looks more like it. Um, the pointer was... I, I haven't put that in yet, the, okay. I, the presenter. Yeah. I, I, I need the... Okay, so I can change the slides by hand for the moment. Okay, we'll try this. I, I'm uh, going to be talking. I'll try in a moment. I, I, I'm going to be talking about something very different to the previous talk. I'm going to be talking about some of the physics that we do at the LHC, and uh, I'm going to talk in particular about finding beauty at uh, CMS and looking for things that are one in a billion. This will become apparent by the end of the talk about what I'm discussing. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And also, I didn't expect such an august audience when I prepared this talk. But uh, so I, I apologize that some of this will be very, very familiar. <laughs> um, OK, so yeah, working well. Thank you very much. So I, I'll just say a few words at the beginning about big science and the LHC from my perspective, having worked on this for some time. And then I'll talk about CMS and give an overview of the project at CERN, and in particular about what most people have heard something about already at this uh, meeting, the Higgs boson. But then I'll talk about something more recent and the search for beauty at CMS and this most recent result that's come. So what, what we try and do in, in this, the simplest way I can describe is what, what I call reductionist physics at the LHC. So we, we follow in a tradition whereby we look at smaller and smaller scales to try and understand the fundamental building blocks of matter. And this has been going on for a long time. So this started in ancient Greece with Democritus, 
and then was more formally done by John Dalton in terms of chemistry. And this so-called hi atomic hypothesis, it's been said by none other than Richard Feynman, who will come back later in this talk, that this is the single piece of human knowledge that if we were to preserve one thing, you'll most likely be able to really build the rest of the sciences from that. So it's the single most important idea that you can have that you can do this fundamental breaking up of matter into smaller and smaller pieces. And we've been successful in this path in the past with the discovery first of the electron at the end of the 19th century, and then the rather surprising discovery of the atomic nucleus by Rutherford in 1912. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then we realized the nucleus itself wasn't a fundamental object. And then in the 1960s, with um, uh, the experiments at SLAC, where they managed to understand that the protons themselves were not fundamental, and there was the discovery of quarks. So this path of why we do this, I just want to try to answer this by talking about a very famous Englishman who, this, this man here is George Mallory. In 1924, he, he went to try and climb Everest without any technological support, without any oxygen or anything. And he got within 200 meters of the top. And people thought this project was obviously very dangerous, harebrained, and why on earth would anyone want to do this? And he was asked by a journalist in the New York Times, and his simple answer is because it is there. Because Everest is there, and because all this world around us is there, we want to try and understand it better. We don't know where it's going to lead us or what it's going to come to. But because it's there, we do need to understand it better and take on these challenges. So I think this is a nice way of when people always say, why are you doing this? They want some application or something or another. But we're also just trying to understand the most basic things that are there in nature. So going back to Rutherford, how he discovered that the nucleus was there inside the atom was by doing a scattering experiment, which um, the LHC is the latest and most advanced version of this. And how, how, how he did this was to use um, a source of what at that time was recently discovered radioactivity of alpha particles, and he put this onto a gold foil, and they were scattered at different angles. And the pattern at which they came out, the scattering that took place, it became clear that there was a small positively charged center to the nucleus that was leading to some of these alpha particles coming straight back towards the edges of his, um, back towards the source. And the rates could only be compatible with that hypothesis. So he had his graduate students painstakingly going around counting the rates as he went around this. So one of these was Geiger, who went on to, de to develop an electronic device to do this, because this was such a tedious job to try and measure these things at one, one time. So this whole scattering process is how we learned about what was inside the atom in the first place. Now, another important part of this, and why he was using this radioactivity, which was the most energetic um, radiation that had been found at that time, and then this was formalized when quantum mechanics came along, that it could be understood that matter wasn't just a particle, but it could also be considered like a wave, like any uh, type of light. And the more energetic that wave, coming from this relationship from Louis de Broglie, that if something has a large momentum, and this is a constant of nature, the Planck's constant, its wavelength reduces significantly. So it becomes smaller and smaller, and you can probe on smaller and smaller scales, which is what we were showing with that reductionist point of view, that you were moving to smaller and smaller scales and higher and higher energies. So this principle is also important in what we're going to discuss in terms of um, particle accelerators. So this progression, this reductionist physics, has developed extremely well over the 20th century. And it led to um, the standard model of particle physics. I, I'm not going to describe this in detail, because that's a course of many lectures that we give our students in, in, in our universities. But it describes all the particles we've observed in laboratories and the interactions between them. And it's very, very accurate. Certain parts of this are measured to this 0.000025%. Uh, so I, I, I'm trying to give uh, a sense of what this means. So I, I take the wealthiest man in India, Mukesh Ambani. He is worth, uh, I think it is 33.5 lakh crore rupees. $49 billion for people. This is knowing his wealth down to the last 700 rupees in his wallet. Okay? 
and I'm sure he doesn't know how much money he has on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So I'm sure. So this is how accurate these kind of calculations are. And this image summarizes the standard model. I'm not going to explain many things in this, but I w it does highlight something about the standard model that was there for a long time and what the LHC principally solved. So if you look at this equation, I won't be asking questions on this in the pop quiz, don't worry. You see this symbol phi, which appears in half of the uh, expression. And in that half of the standard model, this phi symbol is actually the Higgs field. It is the thing that gives mass to particles in the standard model. So until the LHC, this thing had been hypothesized and the whole standard model worked, but it had not yet been discovered. So that was the principal goal of the LHC, was to find this huge missing piece of the standard model. So the Higgs has had various names over time, and uh, this gentleman, Leon Lederman, is, he was a Nobel laureate himself for discovering one of the particles of the standard model, is credited with calling it the God particle, but that's not quite what he said. He named his book this, but this is what he said about it, that this boson is so central to the state of physics today, as I've already mentioned, to our final understanding of the structure of matter, yet so elusive, I've given it the nickname the God particle. Why God? Well, the pu publisher would not let him call it the goddamn particle, which is what he wanted to say, because it would have been so difficult to find and so much energy had been put into trying to find it. So its villainous nature led him to this. But he also said that because of its so fundamental nature, it takes us back to an earlier time in an earlier book. So many people think of it as the god particle, but it really has a kind of uh, anecdotal way of that, that how that came about. I'm also going to go back in history now to try and describe, in a non-mathematical way, the Higgs mechanism. And this is a very old analogy. It came from when, in the UK, I, I was just a student at this time, when they were trying to fund the LHC in the UK. And, and he was, there was a competition to try and explain the Higgs boson to politicians. Okay? So this is a room of uh, political types and they're all enjoying a drink and a social event. And what happens next is a very famous politician walks in the room. Um, but as this was now getting on for uh, 25 years ago, uh, I've had to update this and imagine what would happen if Narendra Modi were to walk into this room. Everyone would start thronging around him, right? And, and it would lead to a large mass in that room being around that person of interest. So he is like a particle, an electron, a quark of one kind. And the Higgs field, depending on how important that person is, he's probably a top quark and more, that it would accumulate more and more of the Higgs field around him and basically it would slow his progress as he moves along and gives him mass. Okay? So that's the Higgs field, and that's there for any fundamental particle that has some gravitational uh, mass that, 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 that's then felt. So the Higgs boson itself is like someone coming in the room and saying a rumor that Narendra Modi is just about to enter the room, and people would start to throng towards the door. And there's this excitation and excitement as this goes around the room. And that is the Higgs boson. It's the uh, remnant of having this field there that you can actually see um, the effect of this field permeating the whole of space to give the fundamental particles their mass. So. This was the principal reason to build the LHC, because one bit of the standard model, however successful it had been, it had not been observed. So this Higgs boson part, as you well know, has been done, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But not everything about the standard model is correct. We know this because when we look at the wider universe, things are missing. The standard model only describes 5% of the matter and energy in the universe. Much of it is dark. 25% dark matter, 70% dark energy. We need to know something more about this. And then there are many problems with the theory, which is some more technical. One, though, isn't, which is why we live in a matter rather than an anti-matter-dominated universe. But some aspects of the theory are troubling because of the fine-tuning we have to do to the parameters, why we have much heavier particles, the top quark being so much more massive than the light quark, where these... Um, different hierarchies and things come from are really not explained by the standard model. They're all parameters that are put in by hand. So we want to learn more about these things. 
So this is the standard model pre the discovery of the Higgs. One has these quarks, which make up hadrons, like the proton and the neutron, and they come in heavier versions, the charm and the strange, and the top and the bottom quark, or the beauty quark, which I'll come back to later in the talk. And then we have the leptons, of which most familiar is the electron, and then we have heavier versions of these. And then we have the force carriers on this side, electromagnetic photon, the strong interaction, the strong nuclear force, and then the electroweak particles, the Z and the W. So um, this was the state of the standard model prior to the, to the LHC. And one thing to notice from this is many of the particles, in terms of their chronological history of being discovered, it is the heaviest ones that come last. And for example, the top quark was the last of these particles actually discovered, and that's the heaviest one by a significant margin. So the way one discovers new things is to get lots and lots of energy in a small space to create these heavy particles. So this comes to the most famous equation in physics then, that energy is equivalent to mass. So if I want to make something massive and heavy, I need a lot of energy. So this equation shows the way of what, what we then did, along with probing those smaller scales, we also create lots of energy in a small space so we could make these massive particles. And what the LHC does is it puts enough energy in a small enough space to produce these heavy particles. And the temperatures and energies correspond to times only a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. But the protons themselves, because they're so small, are not that energetic. They actually, their kinetic energy is equivalent to that of seven mosquitoes. We all know that mosquitoes don't have that much energy or don't feel like that, but each individual one is only that much. But the spatial extent is such that they have a huge amount of energy in a small region. So the Large Hadron Collider, um, so it repeatedly collides protons together and uh, gets lots of energy in a small space, as I've just said. Large is to maximize the energy available, and I'll talk more about that when I talk about acceleration. Hadron, that's our technical name for a proton, but also there are other nuclear matter, such as those studied by the ALICE experiment, that are uh, uh, accelerated around the LHC. And the collider, rather than looking at a fixed target, is that greatly increases the amount of energy one can have in that small space. If you were just hitting a stationary target, you'd greatly reduce the amount of energy that you could create new particles with. So all of this is done with electromagnetic fields. And electromagnetic fields are essential for us to accelerate the protons, to keep them contained, and to bring them into that small region of space where they're collided. And upstairs, you will have seen various contributions to the magnetic uh, parts in the, in the LHC. But for the younger students in the room, this just really corresponds to being able to deal with the Lorentz force that you learnt about in school, that the fact that a charge, when it encounters an electric field, will accelerate, allows us to get to these very, very high energies. And we use alternating fields to do this so that the particles are in time for being accelerated in the right direction as they come through the accelerating structure, of which there's an example here. And then to keep them inside the circle of the LHC, one has um, the magnetic fields, which just bend the particles in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field direction. And they'll tr travel in a circular orbit if you can create this nice uniform magnetic field. So these are essential components of the LHC. So the LHC itself consists of this uh, nine kilometer diameter tunnel underground in uh, the, the, the Swiss-French border which is accelerating protons in opposite directions. And there are four experiments around that ring. There's ATLAS, ALICE, LHCB, and CMS, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And it's 100 meters below ground, not because it's dangerous, but because the land on top is very, very expensive. And um, it's had a long and successful history, as you know. So I just talk a little bit about the history. Um, so it was conceived in the early 80s because inside that tunnel there was another experiment planned and operated called the Large Electron-Positron Collider, um, which, uh, which 
which then this tunnel could be repurposed for the LHC. And then in 1993, an arrival American project got cancelled, which really gave impetus to the LHC program. And there was approval to construct the accelerator not long after that. Then the construction started in this period, in the late 90s, and then after some significant delays due to structuring the money and also the superconducting wire inside the dipoles was also something that delayed it slightly, it was finally running, which led to the discovery of the Higgs in 2012. It's been running again at a higher energy. It moved up in energy 2014, and there's much more data till 2018. And now significant upgrades are going on to the detectors and to the accelerators, and it will run again in 2021. And then further upgrades are planned such that it will run till 2035. So these have been mentioned in these other talks that there's progress for this uh, high luminosity LHC, and there are many upgrades going on within India and elsewhere for the experiment. So this has already been awarded by the highest authorities for the Nobel Prize for Peter Higgs, Francois Engelhardt, for predicting the Higgs mechanism. But one question one is always asked when you give a talk about the LHC is how expensive it is. I'm never sure what the real number is here, but it's estimated here at $13 billion. Now, uh, as we heard in the last talk, uh, the UK is one of the biggest contributors to CERN. It's second after Germany. And again, in the UK, people broke down how much this contribution is. And it's spread over many, many years. And it's, um, uh, it, it, it was over a decade or more. And it turns out that if you look at it as equivalent to any individual in the UK as a taxpayer, and the thousands of pounds of tax they're paying each year, it corresponds to buying CERN a pint of beer a year for each person. Now, that is something the Brits could understand very well, and uh, it's something we've used to try and convince people that it's, um, it's a worthwhile occupation, considering how they see their taxes go otherwise, they don't mind. Um, so I mentioned these dipoles before. These are these blue objects here, of which there are around 1,200 around the LHC ring. Um, they are cooled to temperatures that are much lower than outer space, 1.9 Kelvin, and they generate a magnetic field of, I think, I should get this right, it's, uh, I always forget this number. I haven't written it down. It's, sorry? 8.3. I will not get a higher authority again on this, so <laughs> thank you, Fabiola. <laughs> I was going to say 13, then I realized that's the energy, so I'd made a mistake. <laughs> um, 8.3. Tesla, which is large but over a small region. And this keeps those protons circulating inside the LHC ring. So when one looks inside these, these are the magnetic field regions here in which the protons are going around in opposite directions inside each of these dipoles. So these are the, really the key component to the accelerator. But the accelerator is only part of the story, and I finally reached CMS here. Because once you bring these protons into collision, you have to see the remnants of what's taken place. So um, this is the CMS experiment of which many of us work here in India, um, which is uh, what's referred to as a 4pi general purpose detector, 4pi being the solid angle that it covers to capture the particles that are produced in the collisions that take place at the center of the detector. And then it's made up of many subsystems as you go out, which have different functions to try and detect the different particles that are produced. And um, there, 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 is, there are many of these, and I, I, I won't go into the details of any of them, but they, they try and identify the different types of particles and their kinematics, their energies and momentum that those have been produced. So this thing, even though it's called compact, is a very large object. It's got a weight of... 12,000 and a half tons, which I think is equivalent to two Eiffel Towers. And then its diameter is 15 meters and its length is 22 meters. So these are huge detectors which are trying to image whatever is going on when we collide these protons. And not only is it the detectors, it's the data acquisition system around them and the triggering and understanding when we have seen something of interest. So India had some involvement with various parts of this detector, particularly the hadron calorimeter in the first version. And then in the upgrades, there's an upgraded calorimeter and the tracker. And um, the trigger is also being worked on in terms of the uh, upgrades to the CMS experiment. 
and the muon system in the gen detectors of which there are examples upstairs. So it's not so easy to visualize what happens inside the LHC until you see one of these pictures. So this is the aftermath of two bunches of protons colliding with one another. There will be many proton-proton collisions in here. I think the average is around 20 in the, in the data. And you see many particles, but most of them are traveling along the same direction as the um, uh, proton and antiproton that are colliding, which are is, is in this line, which I'm tracing out here. Now, the interesting objects in this picture are these two red splodges or marks here on either side with these dash lines indicating they weren't actually measured at all in that part of the detector, which told you that they didn't have any charge. And these are photons measured in the electromagnetic calorimeter of the CMS experiment. And these two photons are a prime candidate for one of the discovery events of the, the Higgs boson in going to two photons. So... Um, As I think was discussed this morning, this was uh, uh, in, in July 2012, the discovery was announced of the standard model. Those particles I showed you earlier had one more added to it, that there was the Higgs boson. And the method of generating masses for particularly the Z and the W was explained, and in turn, the fermions as well. And here is the alternate way that the particle was seen in terms of it coupling to two of these Z particles and then decaying to four leptons. And you see this red peak well above any background here. And this was uh, really the icing on the cake for the standard model, showing that this whole picture works very nicely. So one would think this might be the end of the story. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so you may be asking why the LHC is going to run until 2035, because it still has many questions to answer from those that I, I, I mentioned earlier. So there's these questions of dark matter, the matter-antimatter asymmetry, and this fine-tuning. So um, I now want to talk in the last few minutes of my talk about some very rare events that have recently been observed in CMS. And, and they're related to what are called beauty or bottom quarks. So this is uh, where physics got a little romantic. And there are these words from John Keats, the greatest of romantic poets, that beauty is truth and truth beauty, that is all. We, ye know on earth and all you need to know. So he was um, eulogizing about the wonders of beauty and art and one thing and another. He's not actually talking about science at all. But we appropriated these words, or we tried to, to label the last two of these quarks as beauty and truth. They didn't stick. So most people refer to them as bottom, as top. But we still like to think of the B quark as being beautiful because it has many possibilities for us to measure wonderful things. So this was his inspiration, this beautiful Greek urn, for writing this poem. So as I said at the beginning, Richard Feynman would reappear. And this is. Uh, how we represent our particle interactions uh, before we do any calculations is we draw a diagram. And it's named after him because he was the first one to come up with this diagrammatic approach. So essentially, if you know your underlying quantum field theory, which was the equation I showed you earlier, and you can draw the diagram, you should then be able to calculate what happens next. So here is my beauty quark, and it's coupled up with what's called a, a strange quark or an anti-strange quark. And then it goes through this rather odd process, which is called a box diagram, where it couples to this very heavy top quark, two Ws, and then a neutrino on the other side to produce two charged leptons on the other. Now, this is an extremely rare event. Coming from this fact that you have this box, this complicated box in the middle, means there are many couplings and factors which reduce the chances of this happening. But what you see is you start with your beauty and your anti-strange quark, and you come out with two muons. And this is predicted to be around three in every one billion times you produce a BS meson. But that's the beauty of LHC, is that it produces many, many more of these things than other things, that, like these Higgses and top part particles and things like that. There are many, many B quarks to be studied. So CMS has now written 14 billion of these to take, and we will look at them in more detail. And just to give people a feeling, if they're not working with this all the time, 
that uh, what three in one billion really means. So as with most things in India, if I refer back to cricket in the end, things can be explained. So this was the Indian World Cup squad. Um, I know they didn't do so well in the end, but um, it's not even these group of people are not three in a billion. You have to pick your three favourite players amongst this. And I think these three players would get into any world team. The captain, Virat Sharma and Jaspreet Bumrah. I don't know about the rest of them, but these are really three in a billion. Okay? Now, I don't quite know how to describe this, though, that happened last weekend and also in the World Cup final. Ben Stokes is certainly rarer than that, and I uh, leave that up to you to decide how rare that is. That's one for the cricket fans. Fabiola, I'll explain afterwards if you're not a cricket fan, okay? <laughs> so back to my rare decays now. Um, so essentially with this approach, all we care about is we see the initial state and we see the final state, but anything can happen in between. And we can put some new particles that are hypothesized into that box and that will alter the rate at which we see them, and it will alter other properties that happen, coming from the quantum mechanics that take place in the uncertainty principle. That's why, partly why, I can produce a very, or we can produce a very heavy top quark within this loop, even though these things are much lighter. So by measuring this very precisely, and if it deviates from this prediction of three in one billion, one could potentially see a window on any new physics that might be contributing to... Um, uh, to these types of decays. So now much focus is there on measuring these rare processes, both in B physics and Higgs physics and top physics, to try and understand if we can see small deviations from the standard model. Okay, so CMS can see this. This is again one of these event displays where you see this big spray of particles. But the muons that are produced have this property that they're more penetrating than anything else. So in this 12 and a half thousand tons of material, they can still escape. They still get through because they interact very little. And uh, you see these two red muons here. And also the beauty quark has a relatively long lifetime. It lives to 1.2 trillionths of a second, but that's a long time, particularly when it's got a boost. And it moves away from where it was produced. And you can see a discrete distance between where the decay happens and where it was produced. And this signature of the two muons coming from a little bit away from where the rest of the particles are are enough to identify this, uh, these types of events. So this is the most recent result, which is actually, if you land up on the CERN homepage, at the CMS homepage at the moment, this is the lead result that is there. They're seeing several of these decays, and you see a clear peak here. This is the mass of the BS meson. And um, they're able to make measurements not only of the number of events, but also of the lifetime involved. For now, we're a little sad. It agrees with the standard model. But we're going to get 50 times more data for which to study such rare processes with the various upgrades of the LHC. So we may well know more as the years go by. So that's, I've come to the end of my talk now. Um, so it's been successfully running since 2009. And uh, the Higgs boson has successfully completed the standard model of particle physics. But there's still an awful lot to understand, and that's why we're still doing this physics. Why, why, we, why we are here and what, what, why it's there. So LHC and CMS's story will continue for around the next 15 years, where we hope to make many more discoveries. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Hello, if we have one or two quick, quick questions. In that case, uh, can I uh, request you, Professor, to maybe throw a couple of questions oh. to the audience to judge how they, how much they have, uh, and then they will get a prize for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I presume some people are not allowed to answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's well said. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Um, I don't actually see many students in the audience now, so this could be... Okay. Um, so who discovered the nucleus? Jesus. This earns through the port. Very good. 
the name of the accelerator that was in the tunnel before the LHC? <laughs> Very good. I did my PhD on that experiment. Can, so can you say this on mic? <laughs> can you say this on mic? Large electron positron. Very Collider. close. I think we're going to give it whatever. So... <laughs> Um. Uh, maybe then I can. Which scientific theory did the discovery of the Higgs boson complete? One second. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's on TV screens all the way back anyway. <laughs> Can I request uh, Digison to please uh, encourage the... Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, the question I asked was, you said uh, the beauty quark, uh, it's alive for a very short time, but the detector can capture that small interval during which it is in transit. Uh, what is the prospects for improving on the shortness of this time? Um, so, so, well, there's a, s a certain limitation to how well you can measure where that displaced vertex, we like to call it, is. And that really depends on the accuracy of the first layer of the detectors that we have. I, my understanding is there will not be a significant increase in the precision of the vertexing um, with, as we go on, but we have more than enough to distinguish these B quarks, which are the, some of those which we're most interested in. Unfortunately, particles like the top particle, the W, the Z, and many others, the Higgs, their lifetimes are so short that we'll never have the detector technology to be able to uh, reconstruct their displacement. Like, I, I should never say never, right? People wouldn't believe we would have built this thing. But um, at, the, at the moment, we find it very hard to see how we'll get enough of a, what we, a relativistic boost to these particles so that we can actually physically measure their lifetime. So what we have is very adequate for charm particles, beauty particles, which we, we can measure this, these lifetimes of a trillionth of a second or so. But uh, certain experiments have very dedicated detectors to do this. So, for example, LHCB, they work in the forward region. They can actually measure lifetimes much more accurately than CMS. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so how are these probabilities decided? So you said that one of these decays has a probability of three in one billion. So okay. how do we know these probabilities? Um, so there are many possible diagrams that that box that I had, the question mark, you can write down many things that could happen there. And some things are much more probable for a BS meson. So one, for it to decay to a charm quark, strange quark and you get some D meson and some other things. And these things are highly probable because I can calculate that Feynman diagram for that particular decay. So what essentially what I measure in the end is the relative rate between those very common things and this very rare thing. Okay? So there are ways that you can, I, I, that, that's not the only way of BS meson to decay. And other ways don't have two W's in it, they only have one. And that immediately boosts up their probability of them decaying through that route. So a heavy particle like the B has, if, if you, we have this Bible of particle physics called the particle data group um, summary of particle properties. There are pages and pages and pages of different ways for the BS meson to decay. 
many of which are much more probable than this one. But you just sum up all those probabilities, take this one, and you, take, you find out how likely it is to that three in a, a billion. Thank you. Let's thank one more. One quick question. I uh, may know what kind of uh, data analysis technologies are uh, used in this. Is there any data analysis technologies are used here? Um, yes. Um, so there, there, there are many stages in data analysis. So for example, some things are done in real time whereby we first have to identify that an event is interesting. So there are 40 million um, collisions happening per second, but only a few kilohertz of that can be written to take or written out. So you first have to do that data reduction in real time, which is the process called triggering. Okay, so that's the first stage of the analysis, essentially, where one sees those two, two neurons going through that will immediately trigger the detector and you'll read out those events. Then one uses the reconstruction information to try and separate out things of interest from the background. And there we employ varied techniques. The simplest one is just to calculate a number and decide if it's above that number or below that number. But now we're using more and more techniques which combine these things together and use machine learning algorithms and things like this to try and distinguish between those single signal events, as we call them, and the background events. So the machine learning I pretty much any analysis now that's done will involve some machine learning at some level to differentiate between the, um, the signals and the background. And we're always interested in better ways of digging out the interesting information. So we hope to benefit from the advances that are there in those kind of uh, algorithmic technologies in the future. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker once again. May I now request uh, Sri Puntambekar, Avinash Puntambekar of Alarka to load his uh, presentation. And I request all the winners of the previous quiz to please come forward in the meantime for a group photograph of the speaker. Thank you. So the knock, next talk is about uh, superconducting magnets for LHC projects at CERN, and uh, overviewing the in Indian contribution. And it is by Sri Avinash Muntambekar, who is a mechanical engineer by qualification. He is uh, specialized in mechanical design analysis, advanced manufacturing techniques, and he has made a key role in development of superconducting character magnets for CERN. Thank you, Mungesh. Uh, I was really fascinated with the, with the answer this uh, young boy gave about the large electron-positron collider. And that reminds me that uh, this is my third visit to this uh, uh, science museum. When first I came when I was as young as him. Second time I came then when I had kids as young as him. And today I am honored to have uh, uh, give a talk here on our contribution as part of uh, uh, trying to exp uh, establish the Indian credentials for uh, such mega science projects. So uh, there are there were two talks in fact which they have been uh, club uh, Indian contribution to world's largest accelerator and a specific reference to superconducting character magnet. Uh, some of the things uh, which have already been uh, covered, so I will save time and uh, uh, go to the next one. So uh, this basically the 
the the scientific world is really really fascinating so you have uh, i'm i'm 100% convinced that the scientific discoveries slash theories and their technological demonstrations through engineering marvel have contributed to the civilization the most so you have got some some theory in terms of scientific discoveries and then you have to go through an engineering feasibility first and once the engineering feasibility is there then you go for a technological demonstration and once you achieve this ye dil mange more so you go for further and further go for the thrust so today we are here on the on the vigyan samagam um, uh, we have already uh, heard this morning that there are different projects on which we are trying to uh, india has contributed and uh, the focus for me as a as a sun week is on our contribution to the large hadron collider so as i said initially there are two parts uh, first part will be focused on the indian contribution to the accelerator and in the second part i will be explaining uh, the superconducting character magnets which we developed and supplied nearly two decades ago so about sun uh, we have already heard uh, where the world uh, web was born uh, and we just celebrated the uh, three decades of this i do not wanted to go with the long video which uh, our other people are already seeing there uh, mission of sun is basically we see that uh, to push back the frontiers of knowledge right from the secrets of the bang bang and what matters like then develop new technologies see not only the science stops here but that triggers the new technologies to come up both in terms of the information technology where the web and the grid medicine diagnosis then also as part of the hrd development the train scientists and engineers for the tomorrow and unite people from different countries and culture here again i say that once you say you have you have a theory as early as 1964 when i was born and after that in 2012 when this theory confined to a paper few pages converts it into a large project which has been conceptualized not only conceptualized but also has been implemented with an collaboration of an international scale and that comes with a fantastic discovery winning a nobel prize we have already seen this morning so what is our indian connection to this higgs boson see we we already we have, we have learned that uh, we have an atom and you have got a nucleus we have got protons and neutrons and electrons surrounding it then of course this neutrons and protons